Okay, everybody, welcome back to our second talk today. Um, it's from Dr. E. McGilchrist. So Dr. McGilchrist is a psychiatrist and a writer who is committed to the idea that the mind and brain can be understood only by seeing them in the broadest possible context. He has published original research and contributed chapters to books on a wide range of subjects, as well as original articles and papers and journals, including the British Journal of Psychiatry, the American Journal of Psychiatry, the Wall Street Journal, the Sunday Telegraph, and the Sunday Times. He has taken part in many radio and TV programs, documentaries, and podcasts, among them dialogues with Jordan Peterson, David Fuller of Rebel Wisdom, and philosopher Tim Frick. His books include Against Criticism, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Search for Meaning, and Ways of Attending. He's cur currently finishing his latest book, The Matter of Things. If you're interested in following Dr. Dr. McGilchrist's work more closely, he has recently launched a new membership site which provides exclusive access to new lectures, in-depth interviews and opportunities for Q&A with him. You can learn more about this at www.channelmcgilchrist.com. So I'll link to that in the chat bar as well after I'm finished giving this introduction. So this is Dr. McGilchrist's second talk with Weekend University and I'm sure everybody will agree it's a real honour to have him back with us. So, Dr. McGillicris, whenever you're ready, um, just we'll just get going, okay? Well, thank you very much, and thanks um, for for you inviting me back, um, and and for such a nice introduction. I should say, by the way, that um, to add to what you said about the channel, that um, it's not a pay-only site. It is uh, there is a membership area, but it's also a public site, and so um, we won't mug you if you step inside. Um, come in and have a look around. I, I think it's really rather a beautiful thing that's been done. I can say that because I, I really played a very small part in its coming into being. Well, um, Niall asked me to talk about the relationship between the brain and culture, and I rashly said yes. Rashly because it's really a very big topic indeed. Often I confine myself to talking about the neuroscience uh, most mostly I do, um, with just some some sidelights on culture. But uh, today I'm going to um, to do a bit more than that. But for it to mean anything, I first have to explain um, my understanding of the way in which the two hemispheres of the brain function and how they differently contribute to the experience of being a human being. So um, you will see uh, on the screen um, the, uh, as it were, title page of the, of the book, The Master and His Emissary, which um, amazingly is now uh, nearly well, 10 and a half years old, um, and a new edition with a new introduction by myself was put out by Yale in um, January uh, or February last year to mark its uh, uh, nearly 10-year ten, ten anniversary. And um, it, 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 I was very anxious about it, really, because I was embarking on the area which people know as dangerous and um, a, a, one of the sort of popular urban myths about it is that it's all been exploded and there's no real difference between the brain hemispheres. Uh, so the first thing that I have to do is to try and um, uh, persuade you that <laughs> that there might be something in it. If if you if you are interested in really hearing why there might be something in it, then I'm afraid there's no shortcut um, to reading the book. But um, I will I will give you some uh, insight into the thesis uh, as best I can. So um, no, is that going to go on? Ah, oh, there we are. Yes. So. Um, here I've put up an example of one of the actually better um, slides that's almost entirely mistaken um, that you can find on the internet about hemisphere differences. And it's the sort of dogmatic uh, stuff which um, got taken up by advertising, still forms the core of some management training seminars, and generally gave the whole topic um, a bad name among serious academic psychologists and psychiatrists. So much so that um, my, some very kind mentors of mine, when I embarked on this 
whole business of investigating hemisphere differences about 30 years ago now uh, advised me to drop it like a hot coal because it would mean um, career death. So uh, I have actually um, taken the risk uh, and gone ahead. And um, the reward for that is that actually um, a lot of people seem to find a great deal of substance in, in the thesis. And there were a few things that made me think that there must be something in it. And they began from three questions that were never really addressed in medical school, although they were obvious when you come to look at them. They just remained hidden in plain sight. And the first is this. This is a, a, uh, an engraving by Vesalius from 1542, I think, of um, obviously the, uh, a craniotomy specimen, post-mortem specimen. Um, chap's looking a bit grumpy, uh, doesn't really like what's going on. So they've peeled back the skin from his head, taken away the, the cranium, and here you see the two cerebral hemispheres from above, and the left hemisphere has been pushed aside um, to show the divide between the two hemispheres. And at the bottom, there's something that looks a bit like, um, well, like a rather short cucumber or a rather long gherkin, uh, which, which is just a view of the top of what's called the corpus callosum, the hard body. Um, which for many, many years, thousands of years, people really didn't know what it did. Um, in fact, it's the main means of communication between the two hemispheres, given that they are separate. Now, do all creatures have a corpus callosum? No. In fact, only mammals do. Until that point, no creature, reptiles, amphibians, birds, whatever, they do not have a corpus callosum. The two hemispheres are more separate even than they are in this case. And in this case, only 2% of neurons actually cross the midline. So there seems to be some um, reason why evolution has resulted in all creatures that we know having an asymmetrical brain and a divided brain if you like, a network that is not um, completely enmeshed within itself. It has distinctions within it. Now, the second thing I mentioned that is extraordinary, uh, and again was not really uh, more than alluded to in medical school, is the asymmetry of the brain. So it's not just divided, this organ that exists only to make connections, which is a mystery in itself, but it's also asymmetrical. And that's odd because the brain box, the skull, is, broadly speaking, symmetrical. And the, um, oh, my slides are misbehaving. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, so, uh, yes, so the, the, the brain box is symmetrical. And the world around us is, broadly speaking, symmetrical. So why should the brain be asymmetrical? Now, here you're looking at um, a view of the brain from underneath, as if looking up your own spinal column, at the base of the brain. And the right hemisphere is on the left and the left on the right. And the, um, as you look at the, the um, image, you'll see that towards the back of the brain, that's the bottom of the picture, it's broader on the left side, on the part of the screen that is to your right. And that was what was mentioned in medical school, which was that we have language. That's the thing that distinguishes us from other creatures. And we needed to keep language, which is a complex phenomenon, altogether somewhere under the same roof. And that just happened to be in the left hemisphere, which obligingly expanded to uh, house it in what is, surprisingly, known as the language area. Now... There are a number of things about this. The first is that it completely um, overlooks the fact that there is an equal and opposite asymmetry in the frontal region of the brain, which is at the top of the picture there, where you see that it's broader and juts forward more on the right, on the left of your screen, in other words, than in the left hemisphere. So it's as though somebody had got hold of the brain from below and given it a sharp twist clockwise. That is called Yakovlevian talk, T-O-R-Q-U-E, after 
the discoverer of it, Yakovlev. Um, nobody mentioned that because it was rather embarrassing because in those days um, nobody really knew what the right hemisphere did. It was sort of perhaps there to sort of prop up the left hemisphere and stop it from sagging too much, but it really didn't do very much. So um, that was the second thing that was of interest. And that the second thing is even more interesting when you realize that animals that don't have language also have similar asymmetry. So the great apes have it, but nobody has been able to make an ape um, speak more than, or even recognize more than perhaps 300 symbols. Um, so uh, you probably have a vocabulary of about 70,000 words. So um, it's, not, uh, it, it's not really going to have to be about language only. Uh, given that it now exists, of course, it, it, it is connected to language, but it can't have been language that brought it about. In any case, there is this fundamental asymmetry. Why? And the third uh, thing that is interesting is to do with the corpus callosum itself. As I say, it only emerged with mammals, so pretty late in evolution. Um, and just to guide you, in, in what you're looking at here is you're looking at two brains that have been sliced from front to back down the middle, and you're looking in each case at just one half of the brain, um, the central part of the hemisphere, of the right hemisphere in each case, is exposed to you, and you're looking at the right hemisphere there. And on the left, you have the brain of a dog, and on the right, you have a human brain. It's easy to spot the corpus callosum on the right. It's the white area. Uh, near the core of the brain, uh, shaped slightly in an arched way, um, but a long flat section or roughly flat section in the middle. And by analogy, you will be able to spot the same region, I hope, in the dog's brain, which is in that case, of course, yellow. This is not to do with what brains actually look like. This is to do with the, the um, and fixation of the brain. But what I want you to notice is that though the human brain is very much larger than the dog's brain, the size of the corpus callosum is not really very much larger in humans than it is in dogs. In other words, having invented it um, during mammalian evolution, um, nature has allowed it to take a back seat as we've become more com complex. It's no longer as large in relation to the brain, the whole brain, as um, it once was. And uh, just to put the icing on the cake, um, the intriguing thing about the corpus callosum is that much of its function is inhibitory. In other words, it, it does uh, give positive excitatory information to the other hemisphere, but a lot of the time, more than half of the time, its purpose is to say, but you keep out of it, I'm dealing with this. Now, these questions were just too fascinating for me, so I went ahead and studied why it is that this strange conundrum is there at the center of um, our brains. Um, and there are answers to that, which I think if I answered them in any detail would take us away from uh, what I need to be covering today. So a um, bit of a cliffhanger there, but uh, if you know my book, you will, you will know that in the book I do address these questions fully and, and give answers to them. However, let us um, sort of move on a little bit. Um, what interests me is why any of this should have come about, why there should be two distinct parts to the brain. And my hypothesis, and I don't know one that better accounts for it, and there's a lot of evidence for this in birds and animals as well as in humans, is that over evolution, the two hemispheres have evolved to carry out different ways of relating to reality. And this is because every living creature needs to solve a conundrum, which is how to eat and stay alive, which I know doesn't sound difficult uh, with our modern urban perspective. But if you think yourself back into the mind of almost any animal or bird for that matter, that is trying to to um, survive. What it needs to be do, doing is, on the one hand, looking out for a source of food, 
uh, being able to pick up a twig, say, to, to build a nest and to pick up a seed on a background of grit. So it needs very precisely focused, precisely targeted attention that will enable it to pounce on something and grasp it. Um, and it's just the same if you're, you know, a predator animal and, and you're, you're wanting to pursue that rabbit. You don't allow your eye to wander over the landscape. You fixate on that rabbit. Now, what this means is that you need to be disposing your consciousness because that's what attention means. It's the way in which you dispose your consciousness. It needs to be disposing it in a very narrow, narrow beam, precisely focused way. But if that's all it's doing, it will at the same time be very vulnerable to attack. It will, in fact, become lunch for someone else while it's trying to get its own because all around it are predators on the lookout for their prey. And I think further than that, most uh, animals and birds are relatively social creatures that do also look out for and help um, certainly their own offspring and their mates, uh, if not their wider kin. And so basically the part of the brain needs to be able to take in the big picture, not just the narrow targeted picture. In other words, to be on the lookout for anything without preconception of what it is. And in all the creatures we've looked at, there is this broad dichotomy between attention of a narrow targeted kind to something that we want to manipulate in the left hemisphere and a broad, sustained, vigilant, open attention, which actually holds the whole world together, stops it from being fragmented by that very narrow, piecemeal, bit-like attention, and sustains our awareness of the world and makes sense of it as a whole. And not surprisingly, humans are no exception to this. So when people have a stroke in the uh, right hemisphere, very often one of the things that happens is they find that they have a very narrow um, beam of attention, um, a pathological narrowing of the window of attention. Um, and tend to neglect things if they're slightly outside of that window. Uh, in fact, interestingly, they also tend to neglect things um, in the left half of space, which is what the right hemisphere is usually looking out for, um, because that's not really where it operates. It operates in the right half of space, controlling, as it were, your right hand with which you go to get things and grasp them. When you have... The mirror image kind of a stroke in the left hemisphere, it's not that um, the, the right half of space disappears because the right hemisphere is still functioning and it takes in the whole of space, both halves. So um, that little vignette, um, if it doesn't sound to you very remarkable yet, um, don't feel in any way... Um, um, that you're missing something. When I first heard about it, I thought, intriguing, fascinating. Well, there's a difference. Nobody can deny that one. But I didn't really see immediately quite how devastating this difference is or how utterly invaluable it is, depending on whether you have it or lose it. Because if it is true that each hemisphere attends to the world in a different way, and it is. And if it is true that attention changes what you find, and that is very definitely the case, um, there are some amusing instances that have gone into pop culture from illusionists and so forth, which show that the way you attend to something literally changes what you're able to see. But it's a more subtle thing than that, actually, just the same thing attended to with a different um, attitude it changes how you see it. You can see something in a very objective way as a mechanism and then realize that it's actually part of your lover's body and, and then it has a completely different meaning. So, in other words, the two attentions, the two types of attention subtended by the two hemispheres give rise to two different experiential worlds and that's where we're going to be focusing today. Now, I need to address some... Um, misconceptions, I think, at the outset. First of all, I'm not saying, there's nothing reductionist about this. I'm not saying 
that the brain causes experience. In fact, any of you who attended my lecture to the weekend university in February on the nature of consciousness will know that I believe that consciousness is not, in fact, um, secreted, as it were, by the brain, but is um, uh, facilitated, um, emitted, or in fact, um, uh, sorry, not emitted, but permitted, uh, I should say, by the brain. So I'm not reducing experience to the brain. I'm just saying that since most of our experience comes through an organ that has this structure, it would be rather surprising if that structure were not reflected at times in our experience. And it's of interest to me that many, many philosophers have said words to the effect of, it seems that I have two souls. It seems that humanity has two ways of looking at the world, two minds, that we are two citizens of two different worlds. Now, that is an interesting, spontaneous insight that reflects what I'm referring to here. Nor am I suggesting when I say that nowadays and over the course of Western history, we have seen a different balance at different times between the left and right hemisphere. I'm not saying that, you know, if you if you had a specimen of a brain from 2,000 years ago and a human brain from today, if you looked at them, they'd be widely different. They wouldn't. They'd be very slightly different, of course, because everything is always evolving. But that's not what I'm talking about. The best analogy I can give you is that um, it's like having a radio set, which is in some ways what I would um, say rather crudely uh, is not a bad image of what the, the brain is, a receiver, a transmitter. And when you have that radio set, you might find yourself listening to a whole range of channels for quite a while. And then after a while, you might find yourself narrowing down to just one channel. It's more like that, that as it were, there are still channels on offer, but we're disattending to all but one of them. Nor am I saying that the reason that cultures change is explicable by neurology alone. It's not that I think that neurological change is cause things. They're just another way of looking at a nexus of human experiences that you can view in a variety of different ways. After all, when a society or culture changes, this can be for sociological, economic, technological, anthropological, environmental, epigenetic, um, economic and political factors, all of which in any case are um, interconnected with one another, and each of them mirrors the other. We, it, depending on which one you tend to focus on, that seems to be the cause of all the others. But really, I'd like you to um, drop the idea of a chain of causation, which is purely linear. What there is here is a whole network of phenomena, which can be viewed by privileging any one of those takes. Um, and uh, I'm just saying there is another way of thinking about this, which happens to be mirrored in what we know about the brain. Um, it's also um, may seem odd to talk about the hemisphere as a whole um, rather than parts. And for those of you who pay attention to the master and his hemisphere, you'll find there is quite a lot of detail about different regions. But really here, um, wh what I'm showing here is that there are huge white matter tracts, which are like super highways of information that connect um, globally, tie together the front and the back of, the, of each hemisphere and um, the frontal lobes with the temporal lobes. And these are transmitting all the time in the whole range of different ways that I haven't got time to go into. But there are a whole range of reasons why when something happens to part of our hemisphere, it affects not just that um, very circumscribed region, except in extraordinary rare circumstances, it will affect a um, very much wider system. And the, each individual hemisphere is um, at least 10 times more connected within itself than it is... Um, connected to the opposite hemisphere. Nor am I suggesting that any differences that I point to are absolute. Nothing in nature is ever absolute. I'm talking about general tendencies with a degree of overlap. People also say things like, well, they're more like than they are different. I really don't know what that means. What does it mean for something to be more like than it is, you know, for a pair of things to be more like than they are different? But I mean, I suppose you could say that, you know, Donald Trump and Einstein are more like than they are different. But, 
Sometimes it's the differences that count. Nor am I um, uh, dichotomizing. Um, nature dichotomized before um, I got there. Uh, I was just wanting to remind you uh, of the <laughs> picture of the brain. Um, some people think dichotomies are simplistic, but it's a bit simplistic to ignore a dichotomy if it's um, staring you in the face and seems to have enormous significance for um, uh, our experience of the world. Nor is it um, relevant to refer to the fact that the two hemispheres are largely wired just the same. Well, they are, but I'm really not particularly interested in the local issue of wiring. It's quite true that the visual cortex in either hemisphere is wired in a fairly similar way. Um, but the analogy might be between um, Al Jazeera and Fox News. Um, if somebody said, well, they're really just the same. You know, they both rely on studios with cameras and cables, and they transmit, and there's a screen, and the, then you have a, 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 a pickup on a flat screen and so on. They just work the same way. Well, uh, yes, but um, that's to neglect completely the substance of what is going on here, the phenomena that are being transmitted. They're widely different. And then finally, there's an issue that very much concerns today, which is that I've, in some sense, just gone too far. Lots of scientists say they love the first part of the book, which is largely very closely tied to neuropsychology, but they really think I've lost the plot when I then take the argument forward to look at the real world. And in a film called The Divided Brain, which has been made about my work, um, we took pains to interview people who disagree with me, and one of them is a very distinguished neuroscience called Mike Gazaniga. And um, delightfully, he says, uh, well, you know, he takes um, data derived from a laboratory and then applies it to real human beings. And I'm thinking, well, yes, but I thought the whole point of the lab experiments was to help us understand real human beings. And the idea that what you're doing in the lab just stays in the lab seems to me to be part of what I would call the rather narrow focus um, of the left hemisphere's take. So, yes, I don't make any apologies for the fact that you can see this very clearly after there is damage to one hemisphere, either an injury or a stroke or a tumour. Um, the person's personality, view of the world, the things that they interest them and the things that they value, um, their whole way of looking at things alters. Um, and that means that we're all the time, without knowing it, below the level of consciousness, melding these two uh, ways of being in the world, and they have to be melded below consciousness because if you were aware of the being two all the time, you wouldn't be able to get anything done. So it goes on at a very low level in the brain at the top of the brain stem in the tectum of the midbrain, the, this uh, meta control center. Now, um, I have other lectures in which I've gone into the interesting thing about you know the different kinds of difference, um, but uh, some of them are. Uh, easy to mention, the, the left hemisphere prefers things that are known, familiar, and certain. Um, it likes to put them in categories which it's familiar with, whereas the right hemisphere is um, more at ease with things that are new, have not been encountered before, don't immediately fit into a pigeonhole, or have complex and ambiguous meaning. The left hemisphere tends to see things fixed, um, after all, if you're pouncing on something, you're interested in a slice of time. You're not really interested in, in the whole sort of way in which things uh, ramify over vast stretches of time and vast stretches of space. You're focused in on that narrow moment in which space is flattened and time is sliced. Whereas the right hemisphere sees that nothing actually can be taken outside of the general flow of things. The left hemisphere is more focused on parts, that's because it has this narrow attention, and because it tends to like to break things down into small bits. It analyzes. The right hemisphere sees that once you analyze, you take things out of context, so they're no longer the same thing they were before you stripped them of their context. It sees that really there are only holes, and that artificially we, we abstract from some whole scene that we see an element which we call a part, so that we can refer to it separately or deal with it separately, or in any case, use it in some way, but that that is really an artificial way of dealing with something that is always forming part of a bigger whole. Going along with this is the neglect of context, generally, that the 
right hemisphere sees things in context and the left hemisphere abstract them from context and put them in a box of general generalizations. The right hemisphere seeing context sees all kinds of things that change the meaning of something. Sometimes the context in which something has been said utterly changes, in fact, can reverse the meaning of what is said, including, of course, the manner in which it is said, which is always implicit, not explicit. The left hemisphere likes the explicit, the right hemisphere, the implicit. And so all that is valuable in our um, communication with one another is in that implicit area of the tone, the context, um, using metaphors, not saying directly what we mean, um, meaning things by what we don't say as much as by what we do say. All of that is lost on the left hemisphere, which likes um, brevity, clarity, and simplicity. And unfortunately, I mean, <laughs> I have to pause here just to comment that the whole business of sound bites on social media tends to intensify the way in which um, some message taken out of context can be grossly misrepresented and distorted also leads, interestingly, to one of the emotions, which is, by the way, the left hemisphere is not unemotional at all. One of the emotions that lateralizes, in fact, the emotion that lateralizes most clearly is anger, and it lateralizes to the left hemisphere. So there we are. Um, so it means that metaphor and poetry and all those things are better understood by the right hemisphere. Going along with this, um, and the left hemisphere's tendency to put things in categories, is it tends to generalize. Another tendency of our age, where we see people not as who they are, complex individuals who, just because they happen to belong to a certain class, of being male or female or black or white or whatever, are not uh, compartmentalizable and just dismissible because they belong in a certain category. Everything, actually, in the real world is unique and therefore not, in fact, equatable with anything else at all. Then that leads to the idea of quality. The right hemisphere is better at qualification and seeing the difference of quality, which often comes from the way in which something happens, the way in which it's done, not just the, the brute whatness of it, but all the way in which that is nuanced and articulated by how it is dealt with. And interestingly, and in keeping with all this, the right hemisphere seems more interested in and better at dealing with the animate, the left hemisphere at dealing with the inanimate, specifically with tools and machines, which serve the left hemisphere's prime concern, which is manipulation, whereas the right hemisphere's prime concern is with understanding the whole picture. I do apologize, by the way, for the fact that this is... Compressing 30 years and 600 pages into five minutes or something. So if people think um, he's making a lot of very broad, sweeping generalizations, you know, I, had, I have to, or you don't get to hear this. So um, if you want something more subtle, um, read The Master and His Embassy, but even more so, please read my upcoming book, um, which at the moment I'm calling The Matter with Things, in which I take all of this to um, another level. The right hemisphere also tends to be just much more in touch with reality, as you would imagine from all this. And it means that it's more realistic, basically, in looking at itself in relation to the world and at the future. Whereas the left hemisphere tends to be ridiculously, unrealistically optimistic. So um, after a, a, a right hemisphere stroke, when there's a, perhaps a paralyzed left arm, the person is so optimistic that they will deny that they have a paralysis altogether. And if it's pointed out to them, if you bring their arm in front of them and say, move it, then they say, oh, that's not my arm. That's, that's somebody else's arm, not mine. It might be my mother's. I think she left it here yesterday. Or it belongs to the, the, the patient in that bed over there. It's nothing to do with me. This is why it's rather hard to rehabilitate people after a right hemisphere stroke. Interestingly, much harder than after a left hemisphere stroke in which they may have lost their speech and the use of the right hand. And that's because... Although they have those disabilities, people with um, a left hemisphere stroke are still in touch with reality. They still understand what humans are about and what they mean when they talk. But unfortunately, that is not so much the case after a right hemisphere stroke. So this leads to a really unreasonable optimism on behalf of the left hemisphere. And probably the most important distinction that I would like to refer to is that between 
what is present or what in the neologism of Heidegger's, or he used the verb anwesen, we translated it into English as presence. To presence is to come into being in front of you as a, an active participant in the world that you are experiencing. And this is very um, apparent to children, for which everything is very real. It's not just one of those yet. Um, and words were wrote about how as we grow older, we get it, it gets harder for us to contact that vividness of the preconceptual phenomenon uh, as it comes about for us. And on the other hand, the re-presented, which is literally to make it present again after the event, which of course can't be done. And you can only do it with an icon, a two-dimensional image, a very much reduced phenomenon of the actual existing thing that it tries to represent. So this is effectively the difference between the map and the territory, between um, a schema of things, which is very, very much simplified compared to what it schematizes, but therein lies its power and its usefulness. So if I were to sum this up, I, I think I've done it best in a, um, a short paragraph in The Master and His Emissary, um, and because I can't really put it any better, I'm just going to read it to you now. So I, I suggest that the brain has a need for these two kinds of attention to the world, to help it survive and to help it actually understand. And I say, hence the brain has to attend to the world in two completely different ways, and in so doing, to bring two different worlds into being. In the one we experience, the live, complex, embodied world of individual, always unique beings, forever in flux, a net of interdependencies, forming and reforming wholes, a world in which we are deeply connected. In the other, we experience our experience in a special way, a represented version of it, containing now static, separable, bounded, but essentially fragmented entities grouped into classes on which predictions can be based. This kind of attention isolates, fixes, and makes each thing explicit by bringing it under the spotlight of attention. In doing so, it renders things inert, mechanical, lifeless, but it also enables us for the first time to know and consequently to learn and to make things. This gives us power. Now, I said no there, and I should gloss that. It's a gloss that I find myself very often making. Unfortunately, in English, we don't distinguish between two kinds of knowing. There is knowing from experience and is knowing the fact that. So I know the fact that Paris is the capital of France, but I know my children in a way that only their father can know them. Uh, these are fundamentally different kinds of knowledge. And in most languages, there are two words. For example, in French, um, the first is wissen, uh, sorry, the first is savoir, and the second is connet. And in German, the first is wissen, and the second is kennen. And I've been told by people in almost every other language that this distinction holds for them too. Um, so what I mean is that this um, deracinating um, isolating, fixing kind of attention helps us to have control of information which is of use to us. This is savoir. Whereas uh, without that, we certainly know life and the world very well. We possibly know it better, actually, because the map isn't getting us between us and experience all the time, but we only know it in the sense of connaître. We don't know it in the sense of savoir. So that sets the background. And what happened to me was that I was doing some neuroimaging in um, a lab in uh, Baltimore at Johns Hopkins in 1992 when I got a very excited message from a collaborator of mine in England, John Cutting, who's really a mentor of mine. I mean, I call him a collaborator, but he taught me uh, most of what I know, really, um, a brilliant man uh, who had just read a book by um, a man called Louis Sass, who is a um, distinguished professor, that's his title, not my, uh, my opinion, but it's also my opinion, of psychology at Rutgers. And he had just written a book called um, Madness and Modernism, 
in which he made many connections between the phenomena of schizophrenia and the modern condition as conveyed in modern art, literature, and thought. And he's a very subtle writer and very knowledgeable one. And over a long book, about as long as The Master and His Emissary, he takes, I don't know, perhaps about 20, 25 phenomena that are at the core of the experience in schizophrenia and shows that each one of them is actually reflected in um, modernism, but not in uh, the art and history of other uh, eras. Now, this was very, very striking to me because, of course, we couldn't all have developed schizophrenia. But I was working on the relationship between problems in the right hemisphere and the development of schizophrenia. And although the I showed you that asymmetry that is in the normal brain. When that asymmetry is not there, and it is either often not there or sometimes actually reversed um, in the brains of subjects with schizophrenia, it causes enormous problems. It should have that asymmetry. It's necessary for its proper functioning. And I saw that this was not the case in schizophrenia. And also that phenomenologically, again, practically all the things, in fact everything, that Sass referred to, not only had its analogy in schizophrenia, but in right hemisphere damage. So I started thinking about this, and could it be that our culture was one in which we were privileging the left hemisphere to gone into overdrive, as it does in schizophrenia, to try and compensate for what it's not getting from the right hemisphere. It's a kind of extreme left hemisphere condition. Um, in other words, a whole imbalance in the way we view the world. Could that be happening in modernity? And that led me to think, well, were there times in the past when it was different? And that, in turn, took me back to what I had studied before I studied medicine, which I did later, well, in my late 20s, which is 10 years later than most people in, in England begin their training in medicine, um, which was the history of ideas. I was interested in the philosophical aspects of the way we look at literature and art um, and music. And so I began to use my knowledge of that to look back at the different cultures. And what I found was a pattern that I will explain to you in the second half of this talk, um, which uh, I, I, I can't go into it all in great detail because um, it requires a lot of reference to, to specific paintings, specific poems, specific uh, citations, which are best read in the context of an overall uh, exposition of them in the book. So what I'm going to do is just talk very generally, which will sound a bit glib, in terms of an outline, and look in a little more detail at two eras, the first being ancient Greece, and the second being the modern world. Even there, uh, there won't be time to do more than scratch the surface, but I hope it will be interesting and suggestive enough to you to fire you with an enthusiasm to read the fuller story. So I promised that I would begin by saying something about the ancient world, which is um, an utterly fascinating topic, um, far too much to cover, but I thought I'd deal with some quite concrete points which make it sort of easier to, to see some of what, what I'm talking about. There's a fascinating book by a man called Milton Brenner, B-R-E-N-E-R, -E -E called Faces, um, in which he traces the history of the depiction of the human face. And he has a very interesting thesis which concerns the hemispheres. He's not the only person who has seen this. There are several people who have spotted what I'm going to be talking about and have um, researched it and validated it. But the human face is so central to what we nowadays mean by humanity. It's the means with which we communicate and empathize with one another and express so much of what we are and what we mean. In fact, the 18th century German philosopher and scientist uh, Christoph Lichtenberg called it the most interesting surface on earth. <laughs> 
And what is really intriguing is that when people first started to make representations of human beings, they not only had no faces, but they had no heads. They mainly consisted of um, the pelvis, uh, buttocks, and breasts. So uh, this is uh, one of the most ancient, um, a fertility object of a kind. Um, but effectively, there isn't a head. Uh, well, there's a kind of little novel there, um, but uh, certainly not anything looking at all like a human head or a human face. And this went on for, you know, tens of thousands of years. And when the first started to be heads, they might have hair, but they wouldn't have a face. And when they first started to have a face, they had a very inexpressive kind of face, uh, staring straight ahead uh, and with little expression in it. Now, uh, I mean, obviously, these are just a couple of things I've crawled off the internet, but um, with enormous thoroughness, um, a man called Hans Joachim Hofschmidt, um, a doctor, went back through 50,000 representations of the human face over time. And what he found was a very interesting pattern. Um, for most of um, early history, if there was a representation of the face, it was either looking straight ahead or it was looking to the viewer's right, and it was generally expressionless. And then about the time of the beginning of the extraordinary efflorescence of Greek civilization in around the 6th century BC, faces started to be expressive. They started to look obliquely, and most often, not invariably, but to a statistically significant degree, somewhat over 60%, uh, compared with um, the high 30% for the other way, they looked towards the viewer's left. Now, what is the significance of that? It's two things. First, the expressive aspect of the face is placed in the viewer's left visual field. And the left visual field has priority, if you like, in its connection with the right hemisphere. And it also exposes the subject's left hemiface which is controlled by their right hemisphere and is, interestingly, in all of us, slightly larger than the um, right hemiface, which is controlled by the left hemisphere, and more expressive. So the, for most of us, the left hemiface, the, as it were, um, representative of what's going on in the right hemisphere, is larger, more expressive. And by having the sitter face towards the viewer's left, it exposed that more expressive part of the face and exposed it to the more receptive part of the viewer's field of vision. Now, as the Greek civilization declined, this disappeared. And the same thing happened in Rome. And during the Middle Ages, we went back to inexpressive forward-facing or sometimes um, rightward-facing faces. And the most striking uh, example of this shift came in the Renaissance with the great portraitists such as Holbein. Uh, and although he did paint sitters looking in either direction, at this point, um, as Chris McManus uh, in an early paper in Nature uh, had already, um, I think 1976, had already um, uh, established that these tended to look to the viewer's left. And he related it in the same way to the same phenomenon of hemisphericity. So let me just give you some examples of this because I think it's, it helps anchor us in something that at least you can, you can see, whereas a lot of what I have to say would otherwise become rather um, nebulous. So here is a, a, an early uh, Greek face looking a little more expressive. There's an asymmetry there to the smile. This is a 7th century, a 600 and something BC um, uh, Greek uh, I think, a representation of Artemis. And then you get faces like this, uh, which are um, inclined asymmetrically, um, 
have that turned somewhat to to the viewer's left um, are enormously much more expressive and more individual. Um, here again, you see the whole body in I, what I've noticed about it is that it's not sort of mechanically constructed, but has a degree of lively, organic structure to it. It is both in gesture with the arm and in motion with the feet. The head is tilted again towards the viewer's left and is beautiful and expressive. Uh, here's another, uh, uh, and this, of course, is the Venus of Milo, uh, which doesn't, uh, uh, or Milos, uh, Venus de Milo, um, which uh, you know, depends on which way you're looking at it, but she doesn't really demonstrate the, the change of direction, but just the expressiveness um, of the face. Um, so um, that's one thing, but I suppose uh, it's just one little thing to look at. It goes along with the evolution at this point, suddenly, of highly expressive poetry, making um, vivid use of metaphor. A metaphor is something the right hemisphere is better able to understand, as I think I've said. So richly metaphoric poetry, lyric poetry as well as epic poetry, and of course the beginnings of drama. And drama is interesting because it exemplifies what I call necessary distance, I, the need to be stepping back a little bit to see yourself in relation to others. It's a bit like the selfie that's taken very, very close. It shows no context to you, you just are there. But when you see human beings represented in front of you, lifelike on a stage, far from distancing you, it connects you to them. You inhabit them and you have a kind of empathic feeling for them. Um, which always was the point of drama to to help uh, elicit in the viewer until we get to Bertolt Brecht deliberately producing the so-called Verfremdungseffekt, the idea that you deliberately alienate the viewer from what they're seeing. But that's a typical modernist conception. And there was a great connectedness to nature, so people started to write about the beauty of the natural world. Pastoral poems were written, lyrics were written, um, and uh, philosophers paid attention for the first time to natural phenomena, including things like um, Thales was able to, um, to predict the passage of a comet. Um, and Thales was probably the earliest of all the, um, the first modern type philosopher, um, 600 years BC or so. And... Um, there became an interest in a need to balance the value and the rights of an individual with those of society. So this would still have been a society very much more closely knit than anything we can imagine now. But for the first time, it, it paid attention to individuality, always within that overarching concept of a union, not as a fragmentary, atomistic um, insistence on an individuality that is, as it were, contrary to belonging. Um, and I would point, though not many people have, to the beginnings of a sense of humour. And sense of humour is a very profound thing. Uh, in fact, it's one of the last things that the um, authoritarian left can stamp out, but they're doing their best to do so. Um, but when humour dies, then we're all completely doomed. But it's the other side of empathy and um, lyricism. It's a way of understanding the complexity of life, how things and their opposites often come together, how there's good in bad and there's bad in good, how stereotypes really don't work. And that begins to be shown at this point in history. Now, there are all of those things, the, the, the individual faces, the, the poetry, the metaphor, the drama, the connectedness to the natural world, the empirical science, the balance of individual with the society, the beginnings of humor. All these are, uh, if you like, better favored by the right hemisphere. 
And so Brenner in his book says that this is a time when the right hemisphere stepped forward. But it's also a time when the left hemisphere stepped forward. Um, so I would call in evidence um, one of the first, not the first, but with Egypt, one of the first in the West of the codification of laws, uh, the beginnings certainly of analytic philosophy, uh, the formalization of systematic bodies of knowledge, um, the beginnings of historiography rather than simply the re relating of myth, although it was a great time for the writing of myths as well, poetical stories which make sense of um, and are no less true in their own way about who we are and how we got here. The making of maps, which is both a schematization and depends on, on right hemisphere skills as well. Um, and the business of both uh, making projections into the future and making theoretical schemas, which is very much a left hemisphere uh, type thing, the map making in, in the schematic sense. And the making of records, which... In fact, interestingly, writing begins not with some urge to write down um, an ageless uh, piece of, of poetic verse, but uh, the first writings um, were of laundry lists and of um, lists of possessions of the emperor, uh, grain stores, and other bureaucratic matters. So what, they, what that tells us is that writing became necessary when a society or a civilization was so big that it, it couldn't retain things in living memory, where people didn't trust and therefore everything had to be detailed and written down, um, and where they were interested in keeping a record, uh, an objectifi objectification, a representation of certain aspects of life so that they could be mulled on and brought into account in creating a picture of the world. So um, I would say that uh, there was a, a beginning of both something we'd never seen before that was very expressive of the right hemisphere and something we'd never seen before which was very expressive of the left hemisphere. Now my take on that is that there was a change in the frontal lobes in the brain at this time. Um, we don't know quite what happened here. There was clearly some coming together of different people with different genetic and cultural histories that somehow caused what the, 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 the frontal lobes are best at, which is being able to stand back from the world. That is really what they are there for. The most highly evolved part of the human brain, and what they mainly do is not give us a power to do a certain thing that the rest of the brain doesn't have, but to inhibit what's going on elsewhere in the interest of taking a bigger and broader view, creating what I call the necessary distance. Now, from that necessary distance, imagine, for example, you're looking at a, 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 a painting. There is a distance in which it's best to view it. If you're too far away, you can't really take it in. If you're very close up against it, you just see spodges of paint. And the same with a book, you know, too close you can't read it, too far away you can't read it. There is a necessary distance. And so it is with reality that when you're too fused with what's going on around you, you miss much of what's going on and you react to, um, uh, too, 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 too uh, instinctively, too immediately, too unsophisticatedly. So... For a civilization to flourish, you really do need this distancing, which should never be a sundering, you understand me. In fact, it's what, as I say, actually makes a deeper connection possible, which is why you get the beginnings of empathy in this Greek civilization that really there are very few examples of prior to that. At any rate, outside of the Orient, I'm not a, an expert on Oriental culture. So um, why not just say that there was a, a coming forward of the right of the frontal lobes? And the answer, I would say, is because it can only really be made sense of by seeing that it was an intensification of what both the right and the left hemisphere were able to do. That when they were not able to have their freedom, if you like, their independence both from one another and from the immediacy of experience, without that, um, they weren't able to fully become what they're capable of becoming, 
And at this point, something happened that enabled it all to flourish hugely well. Um, now, you may, that some of you know the thesis of um, a very brilliant book, also written in, the, I say also, <laughs> written in the mid-70s, um, I was thinking of uh, McManus writing in the 70s, um, called uh, The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And he had seen some of the same picture, um, but he had attributed it also to something to do with the bicameral nature of the mind, the bihemispheric structure of the mind. And really, he was onto something, and I think was totally brilliant in seeing it. I think he got hold of precisely the wrong end of the stick, but that doesn't in any way diminish the value of what he had to say, because really just inverting it is a quite simple matter. It was seeing that there was this connection with the brain that was so brilliant. And what he saw was that, or what he thought he saw, was that prior to this period in his which includes also the period of the Hebrew prophets, there was um, a sort of unification of the brain, that the two hemispheres didn't really act distinctly. And uh, 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 Sorry, I, that, that, that's not what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. What he was saying is was that it was a bicameral mind, so it was distinct and separate. And then what happened at this time was that that separation broke down and the two hemispheres... Uh, became much more immediately in contact with one another. And this explains, according to him, why they heard voices, um, why they heard the voices of the gods and so on. And he thinks this is a heart back to schizophrenia. In fact, there are all sorts of reasons why that is not right. First of all, schizophrenia is not a primitive condition at all, but a hyper, hyper modern and hyper rationalistic condition that has nothing like the same qualities um, as what he was referring to. But my take on it is that actually what happened was that these two things that had been joined became separate and that the door between the two hemispheres, which had always been there, was relatively closed. And so the voices coming from the right hemisphere, which he says sounded like the voice of God's because they weren't recognized, uh, I say um, sounded like the voice of God's because they were heard through a door as though they came from somewhere else, no longer from inside me, but from some other realm. So anyway, that's an interesting reflection. I don't think I explained it very well. <laughs> Sorry about that, but there we are. Um, but in any case, uh, something happened which was to do with this intensification of the individual nature of the two hemispheres, which initially was enormously valuable. And what happened here, and what I'm going to suggest happens repeatedly in Western history, is that after an initial flourishing in which you see these two hemispheres working alongside one another, there is a relentless drift further and further into the realm of the left hemisphere. And this um, is a complex area, and I really want to spend a lot of time on philosophy and the difference between the pre-Socratics and the world of Plato and so forth. But I think I'm going to stick to two simple points, because again, they're rather striking. One is to do with the advent of the written word. I've just talked about how um, written language is a separate thing from having language. And uh, th there's an interesting aspect to this, which is the way in which it was written. Um, initially, it was pictograms, and then it started being phonograms. Phonograms are not letters as we know them, like a phonetic uh, script, but little images that, uh, instead of represent representing a bird by a bird, a little picture of a bird, you represent a bird by a syllable that is pronounced as a whole, like the word for a bird. So it's one step removed from the immediacy of the picture. And then you get another step in which there is no longer phonograms, but a phonetic alphabet. So in other words, the correspondence is not between an image that's written down and a whole syllabic sound, but just a, a letter, just a single letter. And initially there were no, cons uh, no vowels, there were only consonants. And then with time, you add vowels. This happens with Greek. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is that it's at each stage a further stage of remoteness from experience. First, you represent the bird by the immediate picture of the bird. Then you represent it by a phonogram. Then the phonogram is broken down so that you build up words no longer from syllables that already incorporate ideas so that you're making a whole out of subholes. But instead, you simply string together letters. 
But without vowels, they can mean different things, depending on the vowel that the reader has to put into the mix. This is still true of Hebrew. And what that means is that the reader is constantly recalibrating the meaning of what he's reading. Each word has to be recalibrated within the knowledge of the context. So you can't take a string of letters out of a context and say, what does that say? Because what it says, indeed how you would pronounce it, depends on the context in which you understand what is being said. And finally, when you come, as with Greek, Greek took over the Phoenician alphabet and interestingly mirror reversed it. So the alphabet had the same letters, largely, but those letters are as seen in a mirror. And it also introduced vowels. So it took away the last element of contextual understanding. And there's a further interesting aspect to this, which is that most scripts, all scripts with pictograms, as far as I know, originally, certainly, and maybe with 20th century dominance of English, they may have changed, but until now were written right to left, often vertically from top to bottom as well. But so was Western script. And when it was taken over from Phoenician, from Phoenician and the Greek alphabet was born, it was also written, Greek, originally, in the 8th century BC, from right to left. And then between the 7th and the 5th century BC, there was something interesting happened, which is called boustrophodon, which means literally as the ox plows. So it was written by going from right to left, and then coming back left to right, and then going down a line and back the other way, as if an ox would plow a field. And then, finally, by about the 4th century, it was simply, it's 4th century BC, of course, I mean, it was written purely from left to right. Now, what is the significance of that? The significance is that when the eyes move from left to right, they're driven by the needs of the left hemisphere. When they move from right to left, they're driven from the right hemisphere. More. It's a, it's a matter of degree. It's not an absolute. So one sees these things imaged in language. And one sees them in another thing, which was the rise of currency. So in the archaic era, um, silver and gold were not used for trade. There was no actual trade so much as gift giving, which is quite a different thing from the calculating bureaucratic way of thinking, which is that of money. And don't forget that money substitutes a token for a thing in the way a word gets substituted for a thing. It's a representation. So these representations, coins of gold and silver, took over from gifts of silver statues or golden statues or objects um, over the same sort of a time period, beginning a bit earlier. And I think there's another way in which one sees the, the rise of commerce, the rise of trade, the rise of, in a way, a kind of uh, an empire. Um, the rise of the exercise of power being related to the writing of language, to the beginnings of currency, and these one both sees at this time in the in the Greek world. But of course, I'm not mainly interested in that. I'm mainly interested in what happened to ideas, and what you see there is a substitution of a complex vision of the world, such as you find in particularly Heraclitus with insights that are common to Oriental philosophy of the coming together of opposites, uh, an enormously rich and sophisticated understanding of the world, being gradually driven out by a more prosaic, systematic philosophy in which a thing and its opposite simply can't both be true, in which chains of reasoning lead to conclusions, in a way that pays less attention. I don't say it pays no attention, but pays less attention to the empirical, so that the theory about something begins to be to have priority over what the, the actual data of experience and the senses tell us. And you are preparing the ground for what then came with various iterations into... Um, the Dark Ages. But first there was Rome, and in Rome you see something similar. So, I mean, this actually is just, I mean, sorry, just put these together, they just happen to be some slides. It's such a beautiful image. 
Um, it's and a, and a highly represent, not only representative, but but in the sense of a representational image of nature, in which you really do see birds and plants. This is from a fresco um, from the wall of one of the villas in Pompeii. Um, the connection with the natural world is there in the poetry, but also in, in the sculpture and the painting. Um, just look at these faces. Um, fantastic, um, individual, powerful, vigorous, asymmetrical, in motion. Uh, and then towards the end of this period, the empire comes. And with the empire, uh, gradually you needed sameness to be rolled out across a vast area of the world. The Roman Empire overreached itself. And it needed to be able to lay down cities, as it were, by IKEA means. They were sent out standard issue. Um, and rather than beauty, um, defense became important. Might, power, hierarchy, militarism, commerce. And we all know that in 410 or thereabouts, the Roman Empire um, came to a sticky end. But, I mean, I'm imaging it here just in, uh, see what's happened to the representation of human beings. Look at the lower uh, tiers there of heads um, and the, the picture here uh, of the emperor um, in glory. Um, this I'm putting up uh, because it is um, an example uh, from actually a, a relatively late period of, of the Roman, the beauty of proportion in their temples and how they paid such attention to detail and to the harmony of the parts. And what came later was they, they suddenly needed huge defences. And then instead of paying, uh, as the wonderful um, Norwegian art historian uh, Lorange uh, wrote a uh, very small book, it's totally brilliant, about what happened to art during this period. Um, the, the emphasis on the particular, the, the small, the delicate, the beautiful, the proportionate, the, the harmonic, uh, was pushed aside by the, the lumpen, blockish, um, bureaucratic uh, mindset. And this to me is beautifully imaged by the way in which these temples were um, ransacked and the pieces put into concrete, literally concrete, became, in a, in a rather wonderful metaphor, um, part of the sustaining um, power of the Roman Empire. Yeah, higgledy-piggledy without any respect for um, the beauty of the parts. Now, I, I'm going to um, move on rather quickly because the, the next period is so subtle that I become a complete um, babbling lunatic if I start to sum it up in, in a few, few phrases. I wouldn't be doing you or me any favours, but I'm just going to touch on it very lightly. So, you know, uh, here we've got an early image of um, an empress. Um, here, um, an emperor, um, and uh, that shouldn't be there. Uh, and here is um, a, uh, a virgin from the Middle Ages um, with the rather um, outsized little man who is the figure of Jesus, what we know Jesus to be rather than what he was at the time, a baby sitting on a mother's knee. Um, and you get the loss of depth. Um, I'm going to have to say this rather quickly. There are three important areas in which the right hemisphere underwrites depth. Just take it from me. Um, it is the one that understands depth in space. So it can see, it, it, it is interested in perspective because it actually sees the depth of space. And it's better able to see depth literally visually. It sees not just a flat, um, compressed area, but it sees the depth of reality. Um, it sees depth in time. So whereas the left hemisphere tends to see a slice, and another slice, which has no depth um, or any motion. The uh, right hemisphere sees a continuing flow in which we are always present. And it underwrites depth in emotion. So when people have a right hemisphere stroke, they lose all the finer, deeper emotions, particularly empathy. 
and they substitute for it some rather superficial emotions such as irritability, joviality, um, and inappropriate, um, inappropriate behavior, really, and inappropriate thinking, which shows a lack of, of deep um, embedment and embodiment, indeed, in the world. That is also another thing that the right hemisphere underwrites. Now, you know, there again, it's just a statement, but in both of the books I'm referring to today, particularly the one that, um, that I'm just now finishing, I spend a lot of time on that particular issue. So we see depths disappear, and by the time you come back to this is King Richard II, I think, um, so um, 13th century, um, you see, again, a forward-facing, blankly staring face, uh, absolutely stereotypical, the important things are the emblems, uh, not the actual experience, uh, and it seems to lack depth, um, even though there's a bit of perspective in the chair, it basically seems like it's all in one plane. Now here we move on to uh, the 16th century, of course, and this is the famous portrait of Erasmus by Holbein, one of the most, most beautiful paintings of the Renaissance, really. And, of course, of a man who's thinking had all the subtlety that I've been talking about has lost when the right hemisphere um, is lost. And what I'm really suggesting to you is that what happened with the rise of the Renaissance was that all these things came back. So you see a flourishing of science, um, empirical science, no longer taking science out of a book. Well, it says in this book that, written 2,000 years ago, but let's actually go out and look at what happens to a plant. Let's go and look at what a, an animal does, not just read in some Greek text what was said 2,000 years ago. So it's a return to empiricism, to experience. We get individualism. We get a sudden originality of expression. New ideas are, um, are, 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 are entertained as the beginning of uh, a new interest in history, in in real history, i.e. not just in, in a kind of schematized history. Um, harmony returns, both literally musical harmony begins around this time, um, at least in the modern sense of harmony. That's notes at the same time that, that uh, have a relationship with one another. Um, indeed, the whole business of the relationship between the parts of the whole uh, becomes a part of this idea of return of pathos, return of humor, the sense of melancholy, of the being towards death, as a human being is, as Heidegger would have said, a sort of daring at the same time as a tactfulness, a respect for both the male and the female principle, um, a balanced reciprocity of the relationship between the individual and society, um, and a real emphasis on the embodied person and embodiment in general. And it gives rise, of course, to the, the greatest era of Western art, architecture and, and so forth, at least arguably, I would say. And here again, you see explicitly great views of time because they were looking back already in the Renaissance, the rebirth at the trying to recapture something they saw had been lost in the best of the Greek and the Roman civilizations. So there's always that long temporal perspective and a long spatial perspective. It said that nobody climbed a, mine for, a mountain for the view until Petrarch did it in the um, 13th century. Now, I don't know whether I'd, I'd say that's right. It's rather a lovely idea. And it's broadly speaking true that people started to take an interest in perspective views, in views, the long view, both in space and in time, around now. And, of course, there's a renewed and uh, a sudden flourishing of drama with Shakespeare, um, whose characters were often the reverse of stereotypes, uh, highly individual, um, and um, musical polyphony, complex emotions, mixed emotions, um, and the beginnings of perspective in painting. So you get, just to give you an idea of the depth of the understanding of that face, here we've got a medieval picture of um, a bishop in which the bishop is very big in the picture because he's important. And the little chap on the horse going by is small because he's not important. And there is no perspective here. 
and it looks like it's all in one plane and about to sort of drop off the bottom of the picture. Um, but here, really not that much later, 150 years later perhaps, is a representation uh, by Ghirlandaio of the, um, the adoration of the shepherds. Uh, and here, many, many things to see. But first of all, you see individual faces. You see them situated in a real world, which has perspective, which is heightened because there are so many planes of depth in this picture. The eye is caught by a train of, of, um, of uh, people coming to pay homage and that takes the eye back into another plane of the painting, behind which there's another plane of landscape, and behind which there's another plane of sea and landscape. And also there is a deep perspective of time, because the sarcophagus there, which is acting as the, um, the cradle, the, the um, uh, manger um, for, in which Christ was laid, is an ancient Roman sarcophagus, and the pillars there are also from um, the ancient world. Uh, and I'm moving forward here just very quickly to uh, Claude Dorin, uh, normally called Claude the painter. Um, this is his last painting from 17th century, which does something of the same with perspective, enormous depths of space, enormous depths of time. It's uh, set already 2,000 years before Claude, and uh, the building there was already a ruin with centuries of age upon it. And it gives you the sense of being encouraged into a world of space and time that has depth, uh, interestingly bodied forth mainly through wonderful things like um, gradations of colour, gradations of form, uh, of hue, which give one the feeling of, of depth. Um, and this is just to refer to the, um, the movement known as the Reformation, in which uh, there's a lot to say, but the word suddenly became very important and the image was proscribed to the extent that people went around destroying images, um, uh, destroying sculpture, destroying everything beautiful that they could get their hands on, uh, unless it had text on it. Um, the literal suddenly becomes more important than the metaphoric, so nobody understands when people are speaking metaphorically or when they're saying subtle things, everything is taken um, as a boldly literal decontextualized statement. Um, there's a desire to erase the past because the, the past doesn't conform to what the reformers believed were the important things. There's a turning of the whole um, abstract left hemisphere mind away from the body, which is corrupt flesh and must be resisted wherever possible and denied because it can't be relied on to follow um, the dogmas of the reformers' religion. Um, there's an abstraction not just from body, but from place. So where there were holy places, holy churches, churches, holy wells, and so forth, these were leveled and destroyed. And there was a new rationalistic, highly explicit, um, fundamentally secular uh, drive, which, which interestingly came through the church. Um, effectively destroyed its own power at this point and has never regained it. Um, if you want a, an expression in brief, um, the message of Christianity, which is a very deep one, is that the word was made flesh, and at this point the flesh was made word. I say deep because I think what is meant is that the spirit that drives the universe, which is the logos, whatever it is, is in things, is incarnated. That's really all that the word was made flesh means, that it became something that is also material. And in other words, there is nothing in the material cosmos that doesn't have something of the divine source out of which it came. Now, there's masses of stuff to say about the Enlightenment and Romanticism, but I've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to be rather quick. Um, and so... This is just to remind, remind us that there was something else very beautiful that came after the Reformation. Um, here you see, by the way, the obedient populace sitting, listening to the word, which is exalted in a pulpit way above the heads of the population. And they look like um, faceless individuals laid out obediently on something that looks a bit like a piece of graph paper. And then you come forward to the vitality of Romanticism, um, the moment of inspiration in which the spirit of Milton entered Blake's left foot. He's very specific about that, both in the poem Milton and in this 
painting, but I haven't got time to go into that. And then you come forward to the 20th century. Now, in the 20th century, what I think has happened is a number of things. Uh, I think we've got caught in what I call the Hall of Mirrors, which is the left hemisphere's world. The left hemisphere lives in a representation of the world. So it's like living in a hermetically sealed control tower in which images of the world are projected on the walls and are seen from within the control tower by a homunculus. That's the only way to describe it. The left hemisphere is like this in relation to the world. And if what is actually going on in the world outside the window doesn't agree with what it's got on its, you know, its dials, on its screens, then it just denies that it's the case. Remember, it's very big on denial. And, you know, I'll just skate over this, but I think you'll probably get the point that there used to be a number of ways in which we could be helped out of the hall of mirrors of our ideas. One was the presence of the natural world, which is nothing like the mechanism that we're taught that the world must be the machine that the left hemisphere can alone understand. Um, and then until 100 years ago, almost everyone in the world lives surrounded by the natural world. Now it might be hardly half. Uh, culture, which is the way in which what we know and have learned and have embodied in great works of art, which should be handed on from one generation to, the, to another, has been under relentless attack and is now under even further attack in our lifetime. Um, partly, of course, when you have uh, vast movements of population and industrialization of populations, um, there's a clash of cultures and the loss of the embodiment of the culture. So it's inevitable consequence. And some good things come out of that, of course. Um, there's a loss of the understanding of the body, which has become an objectified entity in the outside world that you live in, in the sense that you get into a highly tuned sports car, rather than something that is an expression of your spirit. Um, Wittgenstein said, there is no better image of the human soul than the human body. Um, art, which has become clever, uh, trivial, ironized, highly representational, abstract, um, often silly in our world, but has tended to undermine deliberately um, its ability to engage deeply at an unconscious level through the power of visceral imagery and metaphor. And religion, which has just become either social work or a kind of um, collection of absurd uh, propositions to most people, and so has lost its place in our life, where it used to remind us that there's more going on here than meets the eye. So what I believe is that we've moved into a world where the sort of left hemisphere's idea of things has been ruled out. Uh, we, we are told that really reality is just painted on the screens of our mind and there's nothing there behind. Um, and interestingly, though, harmony and perspective, which are perspective and painting, which are rather like one another, actually, both came in in the 16th century with the Renaissance. They both went out with modernism in the 20th century. Um, I'm not making a value judgment. It is a fact. Um, um, here, of course, you see the, the, the interesting, complete lack of perspective and relationship of parts to whole. A famous painting, quite a good one in a way. Looks to me like a woman has had an awful fall getting out of the bath, probably because her head is too small for the body. But there you go. Now, if we live in a left hemisphere dominated world, let's just do the thought experiment. What would it look like? Well, first would be a loss of the broader picture. Knowledge would become replaced by information, tokens, or representations. There'd be a loss of concepts of skill and judgment, which would be replaced by those of um, algorithms that can be carried out by a computer. Wisdom would be right out because it's to do with the experience of a living human being, can't be understood by a machine or by a bureaucracy, and um, we would become both obsessed with matter as merely lump and matter. Things would become reified in that sense, including ourselves. And at the same time, everything would become terribly abstract, um, cerebral, and disengaged from the real embodiment of, of life. And then bureaucracy, which according to the great sociologist Peter Berger, has these qualities, would flourish, and procedures that are uh, known, anonymity, organizability, predictability, um, justice reduced to mere equality, 
explicit abstraction, and, of course, loss of the sense of uniqueness. Quantity would become the only criterion. Things would become black and white, either or, so that you have to take this position or that position. When I'm asked to fill in a questionnaire, there's never the box for me, which is, well, it depends what you mean on which day and how do you define what you're referring to with this term and, and in which mood and in respect of which person and so forth. And reasonableness, which is a very valuable thing, which I now see almost nowhere, which is the ability to have a conversation in which you accept that there are enormously complex issues here, um, which have to be a combination of rational discourse and attention, wise, empathic, um, decent attention to experience. It's judgment, which used to be the purpose of an education, being able to bring together what reason tells us with what the best of experience tells us. And that has been replaced by what I call rationality, which is purely schematic logic of a kind that a computer can handle. And in, again, in many languages, there are distinctions to be made. The one that I know best is in German between Verstand on the one hand and Vernunft on the other. So I have chosen reasonableness and rationality. There'd be a failure of that altogether uncommon thing today, common sense. Systems would become designed to maximize purely utility. There'd be a loss of social cohesion, very much underwritten by the right frontal area. Uh, loss of personalization in, in, uh, civil, in our communities and in our societies. Uh, we become depersonalized in our thinking, paranoid in our attitudes. There'd be a lack of trust, the need to monitor everything because we were now... Um, we didn't really relate to people anymore or know them, and therefore the left hemisphere, whose main issue is control, that's what it lives for, to be able to manipulate, would set up um, CCTV cameras on, police, uh, on, on buildings everywhere and have a database of, um, of, of uh, DNA with which it could identify every citizen. Uh, anger and aggression, which are more left hemisphere-based uh, than right hemisphere-based, would become the key uh, emotions of public discourse. Um, we would all be the passive victims of somebody else's doing. Remember, the left hemisphere never takes responsibility. It's, it's not my problem. It's his. You know, my limbs work fine. It's his problem if my limb doesn't work fine. Um, art would become highly conceptual. Visual art would lack a sense of depth and include distorted or bizarre perspectives. Music would be reduced a little more than rhythm because that's the only bit of music the left hemisphere gets. Um, melody, complex melody, certainly, and, and harmony are really only understood for most of us in the right hemisphere. Language will become excessive, diffuse, and lacking in concrete reference, highly abstract, like those uh, manuals issued by management, uh, one of which I used to keep by my bedside in case I was ever unfortunate enough to experience insomnia. Um, the deliberate uncutting of the sen undercutting of the sense of awe or wonder, which the left hemisphere just means um, you haven't thought hard enough about this. Of course, we understand it. Uh, there's nothing we can't understand. Um, the flow uh, would be reduced to just a sum of infinite series of pieces. Um, there'd be a discarding of all tacit forms of knowing, um, replaced by a network of small, complicated rules. Those are de Tocque rules. Um, words on viewing America in the 1830s. Um, we'd all be spectators rather than actors in the world, a quote from Descartes, proudly calling himself such a spectator, sitting on the sofa watching civilization fall apart with a six-pack. And all this would be accompanied by a dangerously unwarranted optimism as we um, shuffled whistling towards the abyss. Well, um, my listeners... I don't know if you recognize any of that, but if you do, it might be a worrying indication that what I'm suggesting is right and that we've gone a long way into the third decay of Western civilization. Um, and quite what to do about it is another matter, but it certainly concerns us urgently to take it seriously, all of us. So thank you. And I'm now perfectly um, able to take questions. I'm not quite sure of the mechanics, but I will now, until two o'clock, answer what questions are put to me. Thank you. I'll ask you some questions now from people that have submitted uh, during on the, on the chat. So um, the first one is, you know, if you were advising policymakers and city planners, like people like that, 
and how we can create a more right hemisphere focused society. What would well, you tell I know this sounds flip, but I would say read my book first, because I think if you don't understand that it's a, it's not a matter of, oh, I see, there are the five bullet points. We do this, we do that, and then we can just carry on as normal. There is no case for business as normal. We're on a suicide track. We have to change. No politician is capable of understanding this. Um, it's just not the way they think. So, but if you ask me what sort of practical steps would be, I do think that everyone needs to ingest this idea. And those who have say to me, I have never been able to see the world the same since I read that. I see everything entirely differently. And that's important because, as I say, the only way out of this is a change of heart and mind. And it needs to be a way of understanding how all these individual problems that we see around us you know, 20 different things that are going on are all manifestations of a single way of looking at things, which we need to jettison fast. But there are certain things on a societal level that we need to do. Um, and I'll just mention a couple. One of them is education, that we need to get away from the idea that it's instilling information into children and seeing how well they've um, learned it. Instead, it is actually helping them to think, to imagine and to think critically, above all, therefore the exact opposite of indoctrinating them in what are believed to be the right views, but instead telling them how to question everything and to really understand a very broad basis of knowledge about the greatest things um, that we have to offer in history and literature, in philosophy. Nobody should leave school without being able to debate a point from two different points of view. And a much bigger emphasis on poetry, on drama, on music. These are not fringe subjects. These are not sort of round the edges of life. You know, it's like the Goldman Sachs person. What I do seriously is make money in an office under strip lighting in London. And then I, I go to the opera house in the evening and I'm entertained. No, mate, what you do during the day under strip light is fantasy. And it's damaging fantasy. And it's ruining the world. And what you need to do is to pay attention to what's bloody going on in the opera house. Sorry, this matters to me a lot. In personal terms, what we can do is, it sounds very banal, but practice mindfulness, which is the whole business of not judging, standing back and allowing oneself to be there for the first time in the world. That is very much engaging the right hemisphere. And in the book, I take a quote from one of the world's greatest gurus, uh, and I don't just mean a management guru, I mean a real Indian saint um, on mindfulness. Uh, and I take a passage from it and show 23 elements in those few sentences which show how right hemisphere based it is. Thank you for that question. Very good. Okay. Um... So we've got one here from Mahari, and Mahari has asked, how do you think the experience of awe as emotion is related to the right Can hemisphere? Can you have that one just again? Is all what kind of... So Mahari has asked, uh, how do you think the experience of awe, A-W-E, awe, um, as an emotion is related to the right hemisphere? Um, it's a very difficult one. Um, I, I've taken it very seriously. Not surprisingly, it is very hard to study because you can't put someone in a scanner and say, now feel awe. Uh, <laughs> um, partly because being in a scanner is not a place for feeling awe, but also because it can't be summoned at will. Um, and it really probably wouldn't tell us very much anyway. I'm, I'm not a great exponent of scanning as the answer to these questions. What is much more revealing is what goes missing when certain bits of the brain are damaged. You just see that this has gone from somebody's world. However, even there, that's a very difficult one. There isn't a big literature on it. But one can see from first principles that this will be something that the right hemisphere is better to understand. That is because it depends on A, being present in the sense of allowing the world to presence to you, not just go, oh, yes, it's a beautiful, picturesque landscape, but, my God, I don't think I've ever seen a mountain before. You know, and this is what Wordsworth set out to do for his readers, so that they wouldn't just go, oh, yeah, it's a lake, it's a mountain, but actually to go back to what is there in childhood, 
the presence of something that really inspires awe. And Wordsworth is very good on awe. The prelude is full of moments of awe. The second thing is that the right hemisphere is not um, in the business of always um, taking what it doesn't know and saying, oh, yes, it's one of those, and oh, yes, we understand that. And it's prepared to stay with something that's bigger than what it knows and allow it to be there and also to respond to something that is only partly accessible. And awe is very much covered, um, <laughs> in a way, in the visual representations by partial representations. So, for example, the picture of a mountain that recedes into clouds, um, something that is only hinted at, that is only partly present, has much greater power to evoke than the full explicit statement or vision of it. And awe is dependent on that, and that partial phenomenon and the ability to stay with it is entirely the sort of way in which the right hemisphere um, is able to interact with whatever it is out there that's not us. Um, it's also part of, I believe, the basis of all the religious sense, which must come from a place of stopping knowing everything and stopping verbalizing everything. The tendency to want to put it all into words and then, as it were, draw the sting of it. Um, it, it the left hemisphere tends to rush to verbalize, and most um, mindfulness and uh, um, practices of um, meditation involve the inhibition of the, uh, the monkey mind, the talking mind, the one that's busy um, analyzing, putting it into language and so on. Mm -hmm. So in all these bases, one would expect it to be there. And in the era when one sees so many other aspects of the right hemisphere's take on the world coming to the fore in Romanticism, all was a very big part of the experience that um, the Romantics um, valued and, and, and respected. That's very interesting. So the next one is from Kate. And Kate has asked, considering the culture of fear that has developed recently around things like COVID and, and, and things like that, what impact does fear and anxiety have on our brain functioning? Well... I mean, the short answer is nothing very strong to do with hemispheres, really. Um, fear and anxiety were, well, first of all, a different phenomena. Anxiety takes many forms. They're both fueled sometimes as a very basic... the history of the of the brain down in the in the bowels in 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 the amygdala and and very ancient parts of the so-called reptile brain but they also are modulated very much through through the frontal cortex which is in a very advanced part of the brain which is one of the reasons why cognitive behavioral therapy works because it, it initiates a feedback loop from the frontal lobes which as i've pointed out are able to inhibit and say, no, we won't be going down that particular path, thank you, um, to things that are coming to it from the amygdala. But I, I, I mean, since we're really talking about my vision here, I haven't anything very important to contribute about that, except perhaps to distinguish between the fruitful <clears throat> aspects of fear in which it makes you actually take another look and realize that what you've been living in is a fool's representation of the world, not the real world, and therefore it prompts action. And the kind of fear that paralyzes and just says, well, then we mustn't, uh, we mustn't even listen to this. It's too terrifying. You do get that, um, especially in relation to environmental issues. Um, and again, there's anxiety, which is pathological, and anxiety, which is important. Um, and not to be in touch with it is not to be human. Um, although I think spiritual maturity is an attempt to take that anxiety into an area where it is fruitful rather than into an area where it um, immobilizes, um, you know, turns one into a rabbit in the headlights. So um, it's hard really to say anything succinct in the space of a question an answer session about that, but it, it's a perfectly reasonable question. Thank you. Mm. No problem. Okay, so the next one is from uh, Isabel, 
And she's asked, could you talk a little bit more about the consciousness regarding the hemispheres applied to the current discussions of the hard problem of the mind? What would be the possible dialogues between dualism and monism in this case? Oh, okay. I think I've got the the answer to the question. And I think, um, tell me if I'm wrong, Niall, but I think the answer to that question is what I covered in my last talk for you, isn't it? I mean, it's exactly uh, what I was on about, and it's a two-hour answer, (laughs) so I can't do it now. But fortunately, you can see that talk on on YouTube. So, yeah, I, I, I begin... I begin actually by saying, you know, what hard problem? It depends on how you conceive the problem to be. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, so we'll send a link for that um, after after this talk as well. Um, okay. So do you have any reflections on the concept of writing to think and how this might be related to left or right brain perceptions of the world? Um, I often find that to understand something and to gain insight or a new perspective, it helps to write freely. Freehand. Rather than typing, the the person is saying that it just they find that writing freely helps them to gain a new insight or to understand something in more depth. So she's asking, do you have any reflections on the concept of writing to think, like how you writing facilitates the thinking process? And okay, how that- so I, I'm taking I'm taking the the focus is not on the difference between keyboard typing and freehand writing. That's not the point that's being asked. No, it's about writing to think and how that might be related to left or right brain brain perceptions of the world. Well, it's a very good question, a very good one indeed, because it helps rehabilitate after a talk in which I've spent a lot of time saying how superior the right hemisphere is. It tends to um, bring back a very much needed, in that context, focus on the importance of the left hemisphere. I mean, of course, I think we need them both. It's just that since we've got into a a hole where we only value what the left hemisphere does. I need to point out the right hemisphere is actually more intelligent and sees more of the game. And I mean it has higher IQ and sees more of the game. But it's a very important process to verbalize your thinking as long as you don't allow it to narrow down what you're saying. Now, And this really speaks to me because I had grave, grave difficulty writing the master in his hemisphere. The reason was that everything I knew in neuroscience, in philosophy, in history and literature, seemed to be connected to everything else. (laughs) And it was like a massive cat's cradle. And I was thinking, how do I turn this into a linear uh, structure, which, you know, has to be for a book, really. And I I puzzled over this for years, and I was really unhappy, because I thought, you know, it'll take me a long time. And at the time, I was also doing a very, very busy day job. Um, and I, I just don't know that I've got the years to do this unless I bloody get on with it. Um, and so I actually went to a therapist and said, you know, why am I not writing this? And um, 18 months later, I, we never discovered why I wasn't, but I was writing the book anyway. So that, that shows how therapy tends to work. But um, I got around it by pretending I was writing an outline. And in the process of writing the outline, I wrote 1,200 pages, which then got narrowed down into the book. But what I discovered, I told myself, you don't need to write this because you know it. It's all in there. And, you know, very few people are going to read it anyway. So why not just die with the knowledge that you've been there and to your satisfaction, you've seen it. Like you saw this work of art. You love it. You don't have to tell everyone else in the world about it. And I realized how wrong that was, because it was actually only when I wrote it that I realized the full extent of what I meant. So I was forced to confront certain things, which actually helped to shape some of my understanding. So it's a very valuable process, but what's very important is that I shouldn't have been, and I wasn't pressured to narrow down what I was saying too quickly. And one of the problems with the publish or perish mentality in, in the... Um, academic world is that people have to keep writing something and if i'd had to keep writing something i'd have collapsed my thinking at far too early a stage into a nugget on paper and because of that it would have inhibited me from taking the bigger long-term view in which i had to keep suspending the writing until i could clearly see what i was doing so it had to go at its own pace like a river it couldn't be forced um uh, like the the unleashing of a dam or something yeah Good question. Thanks. Very important. Very important. 
Um, so Andrew has asked, what is your take on Julian Jean's work on bike by cam- I can't, can't even pronounce this by camerality um, and he, he says that there's no mention of him in, in the master and the emissary the master and his emissary oh ah, well that's interesting because there is um, and perhaps uh, he wasn't able to be there at the part of the talk where I just said what I had to say about that um, in brief I thought it was an inspiring work um might be best to go back to what I said in, in, in the talk. Um, I, I think he was on to something very, very powerful. He was a great writer and he was an inspiration to me. But it's just that he thought that, as it were, in the old days, there was a bicameral mind and it now broke down into a unicameral mind so that the kind of division, the partition was removed. And my view is it's exactly the opposite, that what happened, he's quite right, had something to do with the relationship in the hemis- between the hemispheres. But it was um, that they became more exaggerated versions of themselves and more independent of one another uh, than um, than previously. Okay, okay. In well, a very well, fruitful way. Okay, well, Dr. McGillicus, it's been a pleasure to have you back here. Um, before before you head on, is there anywhere or anything you'd like people to check out, or any recommended resources? And we've got we've got links below there to your that's the new the new uh, yes. membership site. Is there anything else you'd send or anywhere else you'd like to send people online? No, not, not really. No, I mean I think those are the best places. We're gradually gathering quite a lot of the scattered material online under those headings, and people may know that for the last nearly hundred days I've been putting up a poem every day. Um, and we'll carry on doing that for some while, um, which makes a change from neuroscience. But, it, it, but since I think that poetry is one of the most profound things in, in the world and that enables us to understand it, I'd like to suggest you know, perhaps popping in from time to time. And it's painless and they're usually quite short. <laughs> so there we okay. are. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the listeners and hope you enjoy it. And yes, those are the sites. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McGilchrist. It's been a pleasure.